verses tonight of what happened. In verses 1 through 3, there was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job. And the man was blameless, upright, fearing God, and turning away from evil. And he had seven sons and three daughters were born to him. His possessions also were 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, 500 female donkeys, and very many servants. And that man was the greatest of all the men in the East. Have you ever heard that phrase before? He was the greatest of all the men in the East. And then it says, did you see this when I was reading it? He had many servants. Do you notice the servants were last, were last listed? Isn't that interesting? That's how far down on the rung servants were. Cattle and everything were mentioned before. It's mentioned here about servants. And so Job was looked at upon as a man who was very, very wealthy. Now I'm not going to go around the room tonight and ask you if you're wealthy. You know why? Because I already know you are. You live in the United States of America. If you don't believe it, go and count the number of pairs of shoes you have in your closet. Count the number of dresses you have, ladies. Fellas, count how many pair of boots you have. How many shotguns do you own? We're pretty wealthy people. We drive nice cars. We go out to eat and do about anything we want. We need something that's broken at the house. We go down and pay for it. Sometimes we don't even charge it. We pay for it with cash. Do you know the world looks at us and they want to be right where you are tonight? Because we're blessed. But this man Job, the Bible tells us there that he was one of the greatest of all the men of the East. That's amazing, isn't it? And so tonight we're going to talk about trusting God. Job was a man who was a godly man, but some terrible things happened to him because we know that as everyone looked at his life, they said, well, this is the reason Job is so blessed, God, because you've not let Satan do anything to him. And God said, that's okay, do what you want to to my servant Job, but you can't touch him and you can't kill him. And so God steps back for a little bit and says, have your way with Job. How would you like to have that happen in your life tonight? Would you like God to have a way with you? Would you like to have Satan to have a, word, a way with you? Most of us would say, yes, I want God in my life. Don't give me any of that Satan. But that's what happened to Job. His life was changed dramatically because Satan came to him and these things took place in his life. In verse 6 you'll see, Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them. Satan came calling on that day. And Job's life was changed. His world was what you and I would say. His world was turned upside down. Changed dramatically because Satan was now having a way. I may be talking to someone tonight that says, Steve, you've been reading my mail because this is what I'm going through and you know what it is. You fill in the blank. You say, did you know what's happening to me right now? This very day? No, I don't know what's going on. But I do know this. Man born of woman is full of trouble. That's what Job says. He says we're going to have trouble in our life. Every one of us is going to have trouble. But God gives us the mountaintop experiences so that when we're down in the valley, we know there's something better to look forward to. Did you hear what I said? When we're down in the valley, He helps us to look forward to the mountaintop experiences. I would love to go and get a cabin in the blue up at uh, the canyon at Blue Haven and just live there for the rest of my life. But you know, sometimes, folks, you have to come down off of the mountain and get down where the people are living. Are you hearing what I'm saying? We've got to be out among the people. You know, we've got probably 20... Five people that are leaving this weekend to go to Colorado. I think we've got 12 people there right now. And so we've got little holes in our congregation. They're all going to be back hopefully in the fall. But, you know, you can't live on the mountain all your life. You have to come down to the valley where people are. And Job lived on the mountaintop. And Satan came and had his way with him. And all these things that he had, <laughs> the sons, <laughs> the daughters, the sheep, the camels, the oxen, the female oxen, and the servants. Something about Job that's very interesting is that Job was a man, the Bible says, he was spiritually, financially, and domestically, he was a great man. 
Now you look at your life tonight, I'll look at my life, and I'll ask myself, spiritually, am I okay? I hope all of us can say that. Financially, are we okay? Well, we've already talked about how we're all wealthy in this room. Even the poorest of us tonight are more wealthy than people in Honduras. There are people coming up through the south part of the state trying to come over a wall to get into this nation. Why? Because it's the land of opportunity. It's the land to do better. And they want to be here. Can you blame them? Well, there's a way for them to come, but some are circumventing that. And that's a whole other sermon. But when we think about being financially stable, and then we ask ourselves, domestically, how are we? Is our home happy? Do we have a home? Do we have a roof over our head? Do we have clothes on our back? Do we have food on the table? Do we have a place to lay our head? Every one of us in this room tonight is wealthy, wealthy, wealthy beyond most of the people's wildest dreams in this old world. I've been blessed to travel all over this world. The only place I haven't been is to what we would call the Far East or the Orient. I've been to South Africa. I've preached at the Bible school there. I've been to the uh, Caribbean Islands. I've preached there. I've been to Honduras. I've been to uh, several places. I've been to the Ukraine. I've preached in Russia. I've been, and you know what? You very rarely hear about Americans saying, I want to go live there. They all want to live here because we are so blessed. And domestically, we have been blessed. Look at chapter 1 and verse 12. And the Lord said to Satan, Behold, all that he has is in your power. That's what God told Satan. And only do not put forth your hand on him. In other words, don't touch him. So Satan departed from the presence of the Lord, and then things started to fall apart. He says, Though he slay me, look at verse 15 again, chapter 13. Though he slay me, yet I will trust him. Can you say that tonight? Though He slay me, I will trust Him. I will have hope in Him no matter what happens to me. I can't tell you of how many funerals I've done lately where I've gone to the hospital and I've visited with people and as they lie dying on their bed, I have a prayer with them and I say, is there anything you want to talk about? And they'll say, well, the doctor's coming in a little while and we're going to start some medication and eventually I'll just fall asleep and I'll draw my last breath and then I will be no more. And I say, is there anything you want to talk about before that happens? Just three Saturdays ago, I went to a hospital room in Waxahachie. I had that very discussion with a fellow who had COPD and emphysema. And I asked him, is there anything he wanted to pray about? And he said, well, I think I'm in good shape. He said, I, I love the Lord. I've been saved. And by the grace of God, he will save me. Can you get any better than that? He obeyed the gospel when he was a young man, been faithful all his life. Uh, I don't know what happened to him, but things with his health went south. You know, I left that room about 3 in the afternoon. At 5 in the morning, he drew his last breath and he was gone. So before he left this world, I asked him, how are you spiritually? He said, you know, if I live, it's great. If I die tonight, it'll even be better. You know why? He said, because it's a win-win for me. If I stay, I'll be here with my family. And if I don't, I go to be and see the face of God. Isn't that great? Most of us think it's going to be different with us in our life when that day comes. I think it'll be different for me. I have a plan to get my fresh pajamas. I'm going to lay in a, a bed with some clean sheets that my wife's going to put on there for me. I'm going to have all my kids around me. They're going to be singing when we all get to heaven. But you know the chances of that happening are pretty slim. It's not going to be perfect for us. So Job... He had his work cut out before him. And he said, yet I trust in him. He loved God not because of what God was doing for him. He loved God in spite of what was happening to him. And it was not a because of kind of love. <clears throat> now I want to say this to all the teenage girls tonight in this audience. And I've met some of these beautiful girls that are here tonight. Some of these young teenagers. Do not ever trust a young man who tells you he loves you because... He just needs to love you. Not because you do this or because He does this for you. He loves you because He loves you. If my wife, if I tell my wife I love her and she says, well, why do you love me? And I say, because you fix a great casserole. Well, what if the casseroles go away? Do I quit loving her? No. I love her because I love her, not because of something. You follow what I'm saying? 
We love and we love God not because of this. We love God because He is God. Then the rest of it, as we would say in our vernacular, is just gravy. The rest of it is just extra. And what a blessing it is. And Job said, even though He were to slay me, I will be faithful to Him until my dying breath. Well, you look at your life tonight and you say, well, I love God as long as I have my job. <laughs> Let me tell you, I know a lot of people have lost their jobs. I may be talking to somebody tonight that's lost their job. You, I may be talking to somebody tonight, I love, I love God as long as my health is good. And then all of a sudden your health's not so good. Have you quit loving God? That's probably when you need to love Him the most. And so we can't have a God that we love because of something. We love Him because of who He is. Well, number one tonight, and I've only got a few minutes left, God can be trusted when we are submerged in suffering. I know a lot of people have suffered in their health. Job suffered. On our next slide, Job suffered incredible loss in his life. Did you see those things on the screen that I had listed for you? Terrible things that he lost, things that were near and dear to him. In verse 13 through 15, Now on the day when his sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house, a messenger came to Job and said, The oxen were plowing and the donkeys were feeding beside them, and the Sabaeans attacked and took them, and also slew the servants with the edge of the sword, and I alone have escaped to tell you. First of all, I want you to know, Job lost his fortune. Everything that we say makes us a wealthy person is exactly what Satan took away from him. If we determine our faithfulness by what we have, let me tell you, it can all be burned up in the big bonfire someday. You live in Oklahoma. I lived in Edmond, Oklahoma for a good number of years, going on 30 years. We raised our children there in Edmond. And let me tell you, Moore, Oklahoma, Edmond, Oklahoma, other parts of Oklahoma, Durant, you've probably seen your share of tornadoes. Can it all be gone in a heartbeat, church? It can, can't it? You put your faith in stuff, the stuff of this world will go away. But your faithfulness and being saved by God is constant. You live faithful to Him, and He will live faithful to you. Not only that, He lost His family. Did you hear all those things that happened about His family? He lost his children while he was still speaking. Another one came and said, Your sons and your daughters, they were eating and drinking in their oldest brother's house, and a great wind came across the wilderness and struck the four corners of the house, and it fell on the young people, and they died. And I alone have escaped to tell you. So he lost his children. He lost his family. I may be talking to somebody tonight. You've been there. You walked in those shoes. You lost a child. Maybe you gave birth to a child and it passed away soon. Maybe you've had a child and lived for a little while and that child, something happened to it. I can't tell you I've walked in your shoes, but I've preached some funerals for people who have. Job lost his family. Can you imagine? Next of all, he lost his fitness. You say, well, why? Well, right on the back of it, back to back, heel to heel, not only his fortune and his family, but the devil wouldn't finish with him. He loses his fitness. Look at chapter 2, verses 4 through 6. Satan answered the Lord and said, Skin for skin, yes, all that a man has he will give for his life. However, put forth your hand now and touch his bone of his flesh, and he will curse you to your face. So the Lord said to Satan, Behold, he is in your power. Only spare his life. Well, you know the rest of the story. Job was covered with boils from the top of his head to the bottom of his feet. Raise your hand. Has anybody here ever had a boil on their body? Just raise your hand. Look at this. A lot of people have had boils on their body. Can you imagine having a boil from the top of your head covered all over your body? And he wanted such relief, he took an old piece of pottery, broke a piece of pottery, a shard of pottery, and he took it and he just scraped his skin with it. It makes my skin crawl thinking about that. That's the only way Job could get some relief. And so he lost his fitness. And then we have one here, he lost his face. I don't mean that Satan took his face away, but he had some friends and he lost face. He lost face with his friends. His friends came to him and they said, Look, Job, my goodness, look at all these things that have happened to you. Surely you've sinned. You've held out on us. You haven't told us what's going on. So why don't you confess your sin to us and things will be better. Kind of reminds you about the story of Jonah in the Old Testament, doesn't it? And Job said, I've not sinned. I've not done those things. And so he lost face with the friends. And when your friends only are around you because of the money, let me tell you, 
If you have friends only because of your money, when the money's gone, your friends will be gone too. You remember in Luke chapter 15, there was a man by the name of the prodigal son. He took his inheritance from his father in Luke 15, and what he was really saying was, Dad, I wish you were dead. Give me my money. So he took that money, he lived in righteous living, his friends came with him. They went all kinds of places, did all kinds of things. And then when the money ran out and he was staring at a pig in a pig pen, he looked around and said, where's my friends? <laughs> they were gone. And that's what will happen if we base our friendship on money. Well, oh, Job, he lost it all, didn't he? He had a terrible time, a wicked time in his life, and it was so hard. And it's recorded for us in Hebrews, the 11th chapter, in verse 32. He says, what more shall I say? You know, that's what you want to hear a preacher to say when they get toward the end of a sermon. Well, I've run out of things to say, but here the Hebrew writer said, what else can I say? He said, for time will fail me if I tell of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, Samuel, and the prophets. And so he tells about all these people, and we think about Job, and we think what's going on in Job's life, and we say, how can I have the faith of Job? Let me tell you, church, we have got to trust in Jesus. We must trust in Jesus. This building that y'all are going to build over on the hill will not happen unless you trust in Jesus. You trust in Jesus. Say, look, He's given me my health. He's given me a great job. It, it appears that this job is going to last and only get better. Then trust God and pay for the building. No one's asked me to preach about giving the night, but let me tell you, if you trust God, you give it back to Him. And listen to me. God's shovel is bigger than yours. He will heap those blessings back on you and people will be led to Jesus Christ in Durant, Oklahoma. And you can say, I had a little part of that. I had a little part of that. There was a young lady that came to our church the other day and uh, I met her. And uh, she's a young single girl, a professional. Uh, she worked for a cardiologist. And uh, she said, I want to know more about the Bible. I'd like, to, I'd like to learn more about what you're teaching. And I just about fainted. And I said, you would? She said, I sure would. And I said, well, won't you come up here tomorrow night? My wife and I will be here and we'll study with you. Well, that happened. We had the first study. The next Wednesday night, I was preaching over in Burleson down south of Fort Worth. And my wife said, don't worry, I got this. I'll study with her. So she came and studied with my wife. And I said, I'll come back to the building after I get back from Burleson. I drove back to the building, walked in the door. And you know what she said? She said, uh, Stephanie's ready to be baptized. I read your lips. Stephanie's ready to be baptized. I baptized her into Christ. She said, I have a friend. Can I bring her? I said, can you bring her? You bet you, you can bring her. Bring her to worship Sunday. So she came Sunday. My wife's studying with Morena tonight. You see? Let me just get personal with you for a minute. When's the last time you shared your faith over the fence with somebody? When's the last time you taught somebody the gospel? If you don't know enough to teach somebody the gospel, you better rethink what you did to obey the gospel. Because if you don't know what you did to be saved, how can you tell somebody else? If you want to grow the church in Durant, Oklahoma, just think, you, 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 you. We all teach somebody, and next year when we come back on Wednesday night, this place will be filled to the brim. You didn't hire Lane and Logan to do your evangelism. Your elders weren't put in as elders to do your evangelism. All of us are to be evangelistic. Over the fence Christianity. We used to call it friendship evangelism. How about over the fence? You know, I can talk to Logan about baseball. We talked about the Rangers tonight. I can talk to people about football. I can talk about hunting. I can talk about fishing. Why is it we can't talk about Jesus? Why? The other day I was filling up my gas... Uh, my car with gas at Walmart and there was a person on the other side of the pump and so uh, I never meet a stranger and I started talking to him and just a minute or so in the conversation I asked him where they go to church and they said well I used to go to church but uh, I kind of fell out a little bit and I haven't been going and I said well hey I'd love for you to come hear me preach I mean I'm not trying to be bold I'm just saying I'd love to hear you, you come and hear me preach here's my card you come sit on the row with my wife and I and uh, I'll be glad to have you it didn't cost a dime to do that you see, Job trusted in the Lord and he was willing to put his faith on the line and we have to be the same way. And I think the Hebrews chapter would talk about Job as well. Well, number two tonight, 
Can Job be trusted when you are forsaken by your friends? Job's friends, they said, you, surely you've done something wrong. His kinfolks and his friends, they all left Job. Has that ever happened to you before? You know, when you sit down at the Thanksgiving table and maybe you have some relatives that aren't members of the church, not part of the body of Christ, and you start talking about religion and pretty soon it just gets real quiet. <laughs> I tell people all the time at Brown Street, I can clean out a hospital room faster than anybody by just saying when all the family's in there and they've come from all over, and I say, let's gather around the bed and have a prayer. All of a sudden, we've got to have a smoke break. There's people going out the door. They're fleeing like they got the plague. And there's something about that. People just get willy-nilly when you start talking about praying. Why is that? We need to share God in all that we're doing. Our friends will leave us sometimes when we start talking about how good God is to us. And then in chapter 2, verses 9 through 10, even when there is suffering, sometimes people will abandon you. You know why? Because they don't know what to say. They don't know what to do. They can bring a casserole over. They can come to the house, but they don't know what to say. <clears throat> Let me just... This is free tonight, okay? If you want to write something down, I call it the three H's, okay? There's just three H's when you go visit somebody that's struggling. First one is... H, hush. You don't have to say anything. The next one is just hang around. And the third one is hug a whole lot. You don't have to be wise with words. Sometimes the worst thing you can say is, oh, my uncle had that and died within two days. Don't say that. That's the worst thing you can say. Hug, hush, hang around some. And you'll be surprised they'll always remember you for doing that. Well, Job got into some trouble with his friends. They started telling him he was a bad guy. He must have sinned. And sometimes our friends will abandon us when that happens. And we must, must be careful. I want to hasten on. I've probably talked too much already. Um, in Job chapter 2, verses 9 through 10, Job's wife gets a bad rap a lot of times. But I want you to see this in the Scripture. Turn to it in your Bible. Job chapter 2, verses 9 through 10. Job had been suffering, talking about trusting God and living for God and doing everything. And then finally, Mrs. Job said, Do you still hold fast your integrity? Why don't you just curse God and die? Now, I would hope and pray that my wife would never say that to me, and I don't believe she ever would. But if you've ever been so down, so far down, that everyone has abandoned you, and then your family is even abandoning you, you can imagine how Job must have felt that his wife's faith was just lower than a snake's belly, and she didn't know what to say. She didn't know what to do. She said, Job, is it time to give it up? Just curse God and die. You'll be better off. It'll all be over with. Well, I hope and pray that she thought about that later on. Look at verse 10. You speak as one of the foolish women speaks, he said. Shall we indeed accept good from God and not accept adversity? Have you ever read that verse before? We usually talk about Job saying, his wife saying, curse God and die. But he says, have we not indeed accepted good from God? So why shouldn't some things happen to me along the way? If not me, who? Why? One of the hardest things I've ever done in my life was about a month ago now. In fact, uh, a month and nine days ago, I preached a funeral for my best preacher friend in the world, Logan. Not because you're not, but I've known Jeff longer. Okay, I've known Jeff longer. Jeff and I have been all over the world together. We've uh, been on mission trips together. And um, we've been dealing with Jeff's wife, Laura. She started out with metastatic breast cancer, went to her back, went to her lung, and went to her liver. And she died. I was talking to Jeff on the phone, and he said, Steve, we've never talked about this before. But he said, I want you to preach my wife's funeral. And I thought before I spoke, and I said, Jeff, are you sure? He said, well, actually, Laura asked for you to do her funeral. And I said, well, I'll be honored to do it. 
And I have to tell you, it was one of the hardest things I've ever done in my life. I felt like I left a piece of me there. You know, Jeff never thought one time about cursing God and dying. He never thought, you've taken this mate that we were together at Freed Hardeman and, and God, she's gone and I'm just going to curse you and I'm going to leave the pulpit and I'm never going to preach again. No, never entered into his mind. But how many people do you know that want to curse God every time something bad happens in their life? But when something good happens to them, church, they never give God the glory. Have you noticed that? When everything is going great, they never think about, look how God has blessed me. But when something bad happens in their life, the first thing they say is, God must have done this, and maybe throw a curse word in there along with God and say something about God and His character. They never think about praising God for the good things. Let's trust in God. Let's give God the glory for who He is and what He is in our life and how He blesses us. If this church at Duran is going to take off and grow like I think it will, there's going to be a lot of trust in God in this church. And I believe that He'll bless you along the way and He'll take care of you. Well, the third point tonight is you can trust God when you're dismayed and you're in darkness. You can trust God even in times of being dismayed. In Job the 23rd chapter, verse 15, the Bible tells us these words. Job replied, Even today my complaint is rebellion. His hand is heavy despite my groaning. Oh, that I knew where I might find him, that I might come to his seat. I would present my case before him and fill my mouth with arguments. In other words, he's going to tell God a thing or two. I would learn the words which he would answer and perceive what he would say to me. You know, sometimes when we get down and things happen in our life, we start saying, you know, God, if I could just tell you a thing or two, I would tell you how the hog eats the cabbage. And God says, you really don't know what you're saying. And that's exactly what happened to Job. Because God set him down. And you remember the passage where it says, Job... Gird up your loins. You're getting taken to school today. That's kind of Steve Bailey's version. Gird up your loins. I've got some questions for you. And God starts throwing these questions at Job. And Job is just sitting there thinking, you know, I'm not near as smart as I thought I was. <laughs> I don't know who put the stars in the sky. I don't know why the lambs fold when they fold. I don't know why the ocean has trenches in the bottom of the ocean. I don't know why the, the water in the ocean does this. I don't know how the, the water stays on the earth. And God says, tell me, Job. Tell me all these things. And Job was ashamed. And so even then, Job said, I will still trust you. I will trust you even though I am dismayed. I am forlorn. I don't know if I can go any further. And Job was taken care of by God. You know, Job must have found himself in a real place of darkness. Sometimes when things look bad in our life and we don't know where to turn, we get up in the middle of the night and maybe we go sit in a quiet place and darkness is all around us and we pray a little bit. And then we wonder, where is God in all that? What is darkness? Darkness is merely the absence of light. And the only way there can be darkness, listen to me, is for light to be taken away from it. And so I've come here tonight to encourage you to trust God. Go to the light. Go to the one who is the light of the world. Trust in Him. Know that He will see you through and He will take care of you in every way possible. When you have some time, study the book of Habakkuk. Habakkuk is an interesting book. He saw things that he just couldn't understand. And he questioned God, kind of like Job did. And he said, God, how do you do this? Why are you doing this, God? And then another man in the New Testament, John the Baptist. You remember him? He was the forerunner of Jesus Christ Himself. I have this image in my mind, this picture of John the Baptist walking down the road one day and he looks up and he sees Jesus coming. And he says, you remember exactly what he said? Behold the Lamb of God. And then he follows that up with this phrase. He said, I must decrease and Jesus must increase. Isn't that the answer to our problems? We must decrease ourselves and let Jesus increase in our life. And He is the light and He will bring the light of the world to us. He is the light of the world. And He will help us in our struggles. What about Paul? <laughs> I tell you, when I was a young man and I would have gospel meetings and be at gospel meetings with my mom and my dad, I always wondered why preachers preach so much about Paul. 
Lane, you ever thought about that, Logan? Why do preachers talk about Paul so much? Let me tell you why. Because he was brilliant. He had the equivalent to three doctorate degrees and two master's degrees. He confounded people with the scriptures all the time. He knew their arguments. He knew where they were coming from. And Paul was used to preach the gospel. In fact, he was a man who used to kill Christians. And now he's being looked at as a man who is making Christians. What a change in his life. But look what happened to Paul. Terrible things. Taken to the edge of city. Stoned. Left for dead. Can you imagine? And Paul was brilliant. And God allowed these things to happen to him. And yet he was still a great, great man. The sovereignty of God is something that God teaches us about himself. That God is sovereign. There is no other. Let me tell you, you put your faith in the presidency... You put your faith in Congress. You put your faith in the governor. People are going to disappoint you. I wish our president would learn to put his hand over his mouth. And I wish his tweeter would break. I'm sorry. But let me ask you this. Instead of complaining about the president, have you prayed for him? If there's any man in this world that needs the prayers, it's our president. God is sovereign. In chapter 38, verses 1 through 7, and then the Lord answered Job out of a whirlwind. And he said, Who is this that darkens counsel by words without knowledge? <laughs> now gird up your loins like a man, and I'll ask you and instruct me. Were you there when I laid the foundations of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who sets its measure since you know Job? Or who stretched the line upon it? Or what is there in the bases that sunk? Or who laid its cornerstone when the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy? He's asking Job these questions. And of course Job can't answer it because he's learning about the sovereignty of God. The next thing is the sufficiency of God. Job 42 and verse 5 says, I have heard you by the hearing of the ear. Now my eye sees you. Have we ever said something like that before? Oh, I see. I see what's going on. That's what Job said. I see what's happening. Not only do I hear you, God, but I see what you're saying. And then the sympathy of God. He learned not only the sovereignty of God, but he learned in chapter 42, verses 10 through 13. The Lord restored the fortunes of Job when he prayed for his friends. And the Lord increased all that Job had. Not only did he give it back to him, he doubled it. Did you know that? He doubled everything he had. His brothers and all his sisters and all had known him before came to him. They ate bread with him in the house. They consoled him, confronted him, I'm sorry, comforted him for all the adversities that the Lord had brought on him. And each one gave him a piece of money and each a gold ring. And the Lord blessed the later days of Job more than in the beginning. He had 14,000 sheep, 6,000 camels, 1,000 yoke of oxen, 1,000 female donkeys, and seven sons and three daughters. Did you notice that? He gave him sons and daughters. But nothing's mentioned about where his wife was. Well, the fact of the matter is, I think only a woman could understand this passage better than us men. Because those first children that Mrs. Job had, <laughs> you think they were special to that mother? And then they were killed. I haven't asked Jeff this yet, but when I have the right opportunity, and Lord willing, I'll see him tomorrow, people intend to say the nicest things when someone dies, and sometimes we really stick our foot in our mouth when we do, and we need to think before we speak. But someone is bound to have said to Jeff in the last month, I'm sorry you lost your wife. You know what I'm going to tell Jeff tomorrow? I said, Jeff, you didn't lose your wife. You know right where she is. She's looking in the face of Jesus this morning. She's with God in heaven. Could you say that tonight? You know exactly where your loved one is? I hope you can. Will people say of you, she's a woman that trusted in God. He's a man that had trust and faith in God. 
and they live their life that very fashion. There might be someone here tonight that you look at your life and um, I have this neat little clock up here and it says it's 7.55. I've got five minutes, but we're going to sing a song. And we're going to give you an opportunity to think about where you are spiritually tonight. I want to ask you as a man and a woman, are you trusting in God? Teenagers, are you going to trust in God when school starts and stand up for Jesus? Or are you going to be silent and sit on your hands? Are you going to speak up when someone in class says something against the Bible? Or are you just going to be quiet? Or are you going to speak up for Jesus? Are you going to talk to somebody over the fence that maybe you can talk about everything but Jesus? If you trust in God, He'll help you. You can say, you know, that's a great question. I don't know. Let me go home and study that and I'll come back to you with the answer. What's wrong with that? Not a thing. Not everybody has to know everything. But you can find out. Maybe there's someone here tonight who's going through a struggle. You never let anybody know about it tonight. Would you want to come and have your elders pray for you? What a great thing to do to have your shepherds pray for you as they shepherd your soul. How will they know what to pray for if you don't tell them? Is there someone here tonight that needs to respond? We stand ready to help you. Let's stand and you come forward if we can serve you in any way.